السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي حج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam One of the most vivid manifestations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy on the believers and his love and his forgiveness, his desire to forgive the believers is the opportunities that he extends to us in order that we attain the highest rank that we can with him and we attain the highest station in paradise based upon the sacrifices and good deeds that we do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أُولَٰئِكَ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى النَّارِ وَاللَّهُ يَدْعُوا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ وَمَغْفِرَةٍ بِإِذْنِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the disbelievers that they only invite you to the hellfire while Allah invites you to Jannah. Allah is inviting you to Jannah. Allah is telling us, come to Jannah. I can't give it to you, but I'm going to make it easy for you to get it. Inviting you to Jannah until his forgiveness by his permission. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned an authentic hadith collected in the jami of the Imam al-Tirmidhi. قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في الجنة مئة درجة ما بين كل درجتين كما بين السماء والأرض والفردوس أعلىها درجة 
ومنها تفجر الأنهار أنهار الجنة الأربع ومن فوقها يكون العرش فإذا سألتم الله جل وعلا الجنة فاسألوه الفردوس The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that in Jannah there are a hundred levels and Jannah has darajat which go up and the hellfire has darakat which go down in levels. He said in Jannah mi'at daraja there are a hundred degrees, a hundred levels in paradise. مَا بَيْنَ كُلِّ دَرَجَتَيْنِ كَمَا بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ Between each level in Jannah is like the distance between the heavens and the earth. That's one level. The distance between one level and another is like the distance between the heavens and the earth. He said, and the highest part of Jannah is Al-Firdaus. In this place, Firdaus, there are the four rivers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in the Qur'an that are in this particular level in Jannah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala identifies these four rivers, He says, مَثَلُ الْجَنَّةُ الَّتِي وُعِدَ الْمُتَّقُونَ the example of the paradise in which the believers have been promised. He said, فِيهَا أَنْهَارٌ مِنْ مَاءٍ غَيْرِ آسٍ There will be water, fresh, pure water. One of the rivers in Jannah will be a river of pure water. He said, وَأَنْهَارٌ مِنْ لَبْنٍ لَمْ يَتَغَيَّرَ طَعْمُهُ And then there will be another the river of milk, which the taste never changes. It never gets old, it never spoils. It will be pure, fresh milk. Until Yomuki until forever. Ila Abad. He said, and then there's another river. And there will be a river of of khamar, of alcohol, a river of khamar that will not get you drunk, and the taste will be ledda, will be sweet to those who drink it. And then there will be an harun min asan and musaffa. And then there will be a river of pure honey. These are the four rivers, but these four rivers are in the highest place in Jannah, which is known as Firdaus. Right above in Firdaus is the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the canopy of the highest place in Jannah, which is in Firdaus. He says, so when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Jannah, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Firdaus. Meaning, have high aspirations when you seek Jannah. Don't just be content with getting into Jannah. Don't just be content with being forgiven. Don't just be content that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow you in any level in Jannah. No, aim for the highest place in Jannah, which is Firdaus al-A'la. He says, so when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Jannah, don't just ask Him for Jannah. Ask Him for Firdaus al-A'la. Ask Him for the highest place in Jannah. In another narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, in the Jannah, مِئَةَ دَرَجَةً لَوْ أَنَّ الْعَامِلِينَ اجْتَمَعُوا فِي فِي مَكَانٍ وَاحِدٍ فِي إِحْدَى هُنَّ لَوَسِعَتْهُمْ The Prophet sallallahu in another hadith, he said that in Jannah there are a hundred levels in Jannah. He said, and if everyone who did good deeds seeking Jannah were to gather at one place in one of the levels in Jannah, that one level would be enough for all of them. That one level would be enough for everybody. Unfortunately, many Muslims today are heedless due to the idea that we are all equal and that everyone should be recognized equally so no one feels inferior. Even when we have Quran competitions, we have different types of competitions today. You got first place, second place, third place, fourth place, and then we have an award for everybody who participated because we don't want anybody to walk away feeling slighted. We don't want anybody to walk away feeling less than. And so we take the ambition away from the competition. And we obliterate the need for healthy competition, which fuels the ambition of those who strive to be better than mediocre. As what doesn't challenge you is not going to change you. If you don't want to be challenged, if you go to an event, a competition, and you come in last, or you don't get an award, that should be drive for you the next time. That the next time you compete, you come in at first. But we want to acknowledge everybody so that no one walks away feeling inferior. And all throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages the believers to compete with one another, to get closer to Him, to earn His forgiveness, and to seek the ultimate goal of paradise. As forgiveness and paradise are usually mentioned in the same vein, 
In most ayats in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time he mentions paradise, he always mentions his forgiveness. And every time he mentions his forgiveness, usually he mentions paradise along with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, fostering this atmosphere of competition between the believers. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and rush with one another. Hasten with one another. Race with one another. This is a competition. Sari'u. <laughs> race with one another. To the forgiveness of Allah, of Allah, of your Lord and His paradise. Notice forgiveness and paradise mentioned here again in the second ayah that I mentioned. Second ayah here. Paradise and forgiveness mentioned in the same vein. And rush with one another. Race with one another for the forgiveness of your Lord and a paradise who's with is the distance of the heavens and the earth that is prepared for those who are muttaqeen, those who are pious and righteous. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next few ayahs goes on to mention many of the different deeds that we can do to compete with one another. He said, <laughs> Those who spend, give sadaqah when they are in poverty and when they are in prosperity. Meaning, just because you don't have it is not an excuse for you not to give. And we're going to see some examples during this khutbah with many of the sahaba who were financially challenged but still looked for a way to compete with many of the sahaba who were wealthy and rich and had it to give. Today we say, oh, I don't have it. And we use that as an excuse to cut off giving sadaqah as one of our different streams or one of the different ways in which we are going to earn jannah. We just think that some of us just think we're going to get there through salat. And fasting in the month of Ramadan. And that's it. Diversify the way that you're going to get to Jannah. There's so many different ways. Find way, find the way that is easy for you. And stick with it. But then there were some like Abu Bakr anhu, who he, when the Prophet wasallam said that there are eight gates to Jannah. And Abu Bakr said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, is it possible that a person can enter, through, enter into Jannah through all of the eight gates? I don't just want to enter through one how about I'm that good that I can enter into Jannah through all of the eight gates of Jannah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, Abu Bakr, it is possible that a person can enter into Jannah through all of the eight gates. He said, well, I'll do into Kunna Minhum, and I hope that you are from amongst them. Abu Bakr was very ambitious, very competitive. Jannah was not something that they just desired. Jannah was something that they, they were willing to risk it all to get. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those who spin in poverty as well as in prosperity. And those who control their anger. And those who pardon and forgive people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the ayah. Uh, and those who, when they do evil, they do bad deeds, those who, when they do sinful acts, they remember Allah and they seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. For who can forgive sins other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And they do not persist in their disobedience while they know better. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. He said, أُولَٰئِكَ جَزَاؤُهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَجَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِن تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَنِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامِلِينَ Allah ends the verse by saying, and these, for these individuals who compete in these particular deeds, for them is forgiveness from their Lord and paradise. Forgiveness from their Lord and paradise. Gardens under which rivers flow to dwell therein forever. And how excellent is the reward for those who put in work. How excellent is the reward for those who put in work. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a list of deeds that we can do to compete with one another in. He mentioned giving sadaqah. He mentioned controlling your anger. He mentioned partnering people, learning how to forgive. We grew up, many of us grew up in environments, cultures, and in homes in which we weren't even shown forgiveness. So we have no concept of what it means to forgive someone when they wronged us. 
We spend, most of us have spent our entire lives extracting retribution from every single individual, from every single violation that has ever been done to us. When do you forgive? When do you practice forgiveness? When do you practice letting things go? And some of us, we don't have a concept of that. So just as we learn these behaviors, we have to unlearn these behaviors. And there's no greater time to do that than in the month of forgiveness, the month of Ramadan. Pardoning people, forgiving people, repenting, and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what is called healthy competition for those who are up for the challenge. As Allah mentions in another ayat in the Quran, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ And for Jannah, let those of you who want to compete, let you compete. Some of you are sitting here listening to me right now like, man, what is this guy talking about? I'm not in competition with nobody but myself. Well, I'm sorry for you, because I'm here to outdo every single one of you. When you get up and you walk out without making your sunnah prayers, there's somebody watching you like, oh, they didn't make their sunnah prayers. I'm making my sunnah prayers. You walk right out the door, you don't leave anything sadaqah, I'm going to leave sadaqah. They just outdid you in two things that you just took lightly and walked past. So on Yom Al-Qiyamah, when people are going in higher ranks in Jannah, and you're at this low place, you're going to be wondering why. Because the floors of Jannah are glass. You can actually see people on the different levels in Jannah. And that is a punishment for those of us in Jannah that didn't strive hard because while we look up and see people on the upper tiers and the upper levels enjoying the VIP section, we are down here on the low, low, lowly parts of Jannah because all we did was salat and fast and hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would just allow us to get into Jannah. Very low ambitions, man. Our deen is a deen of enthusiasm. Our deen is a deen of competition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَفَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ And for Jannah, let those of you who want to compete, let you compete. The scholars, they say, كَوْنَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala هُوَ الَّذِي يُحَرِّضُنَا عَلَى التَّنَافُسِ فِي هَذَا النَّعِيمِ فَهَذِهِ أَعْظَمْ دَلِيلَ عَلَى أُولُو شَأْنِ هَذَا النَّعِيمِ The scholars, they say, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging us to compete with one another for Jannah shows you how great Jannah is that Allah would tell us to compete. And understand, Jannah is the merchandise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is selling to us. If you're a merchant, you're an entrepreneur, you're a store owner, business owner, you sell things, right? And you look at the top quality things in your store that you sell. The most expensive thing in the store that you own that you sell. The most expensive thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is selling to us is Jannah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna sil'atullahi hiya ghaliya, ala inna sil'atullahi hiya jannah. He said the sil'a, the property of Allah, the merchandise that Allah is selling is expensive. And the most expensive merchandise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Jannah. And Jannah is expensive. And just like anything expensive, if I were to walk into your store and tell you to give me the most expensive thing in your store for free, you would look at me like I'm majnoon, like I'm crazy. Give it to you for free. I can't give you this. This is the most expensive thing in my store. I can't give it to you for free. So how do you expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you the most expensive thing that he's selling? For free. You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just going to give you Jannah? Doesn't work like that. Anything that is expensive cannot be given away except with some form of exchange that makes giving it away worth the exchange. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed us here on earth, brothers and sisters, as a test of our zeal and our enthusiasm for doing good and to earn our way back to paradise after our father Adam السلام, was removed from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, بَعْدَ عُوذَ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ الَّذِي, جعل... الذي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tabarak alladhi, blessed be he, in whose hands the dominion, the kingdom belongs. Just the start of the surah is magnificent. You don't even need to move forward after that one ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins. There are some surahs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins and it just blows your mind, the first ayat. So you can almost imagine what the rest of the surah is going to be like. He said, blessed be he. He's praising himself. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can only be praised as he praises himself. No matter how much we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will never be able to praise him as he deserves to be praised. And to come at ethnate out of nafsik, as the Prophet used to say in dua, you are as you you deserve to be praised as you have praised yourself. Blessed be he in whose hands is the kingdom of the heavens and the earth, and he has power over all things. The one who created death and life to test you to see which one of you is best in deeds. That's what this is all about. It's a test to see which one of us are best in deeds, not which one does the most deeds. He didn't say to test you to see who is ekthar amala, not to see who is the most in deeds, who does the most deeds, but ahsanu amala, to test you to see who does the best deeds. Rubba amalan sagheeran to kabbiru huwa niyyah. Because as the scholars say that perhaps a small deed will be made magnificent because of the intention that is behind it. وَرُبَّ عَمَلٍ كَبِيرًا تُسَغِّرُهُ النِّيَةٍ And perhaps a magnificent deed that is done in your eyes, you think that it's a great deed, but it is rendered insignificant because of the intention that was behind it. It's not about how much. It's about the consistency and the sincerity behind it. And so it is based upon this striving that our place in Jannah will be determined. As paradise has many levels, that is commensurate with the amount of or the degree of work that we put in which distinguishes those of us who settle for mediocrity and those who are willing to risk it all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لِكُلِّنْ دَرَجَاتٌ مِمَّا عَمِلُوا وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا يَعْمَلُونَ And for every soul, they will have a degree in paradise based upon the deeds that they have done. لِكُلِّنْ دَرَجَاتٌ مِمَّا عَمِلُوا Everyone will have a degree, a station, a place in paradise based upon the deeds that you have done. And your Lord is not heedless of the things that you do. During the early period of Islam, brothers and sisters, the Sahaba were extremely competitive with one another for Jannah. They understood that not all of them were going to be on the same level. As even one man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Mata Sa'a, when is the last day, O Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet وسلم, asked him, Wama a'adatta laha, what have you done to prepare for the last day? He said, Wala shay'in kathiru min as salat wa siyam, lakinni uhibbu Allah wa rasulah. He said, I haven't done much, O Messenger of Allah, not much fasting, not much prayer. I'm mediocre. I haven't done much. He said, but I love Allah and I love His Messenger. And the Prophet said, And you will be in Jannah with the people that you love. And Anas said, Anas and many of the Sahaba said that we were never more excited with something the Prophet وسلم, said, like the day when he said, you will be in paradise with the people that you love. Because all of us love Allah, all of us love the Messenger of Allah, all of us love Abu Bakr, all of us love Umar. And we would love to be in Jannah with them even though we don't do the deeds that they do. You understand? They knew that it was a distinction between them. They knew that people like Abu Bakr and Umar, they were very competitive for Jannah. The Prophet وسلم, mentioned in the hadith where he mentioned 70,000 from his ummah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him different prophets and different nations yawm al-qiyamah. He said there's some prophets that come with a small group 
There's some prophets that come with one or two people behind them. And he said, there are some prophets that nobody is behind them. He said, then, the, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me this group of people, this large group of people, and said, that is your ummah. But within that large group, there's 70,000 from that group that will be entered into paradise. No questioning, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the gates of Jannah for you and tell you, salam. enter into Jannah with salam, with peace. He will never ask you about one deed that you did. Your record will not even be opened. You will be told to enter into Jannah. No reckoning, no punishment. So the Sahaba started thinking, well, who could these people be? What are the deeds that they're doing so that they could be from so that they could be from amongst them? Then the Prophet ﷺ woke up the next morning and the Sahaba, they were curious to find out what are these people doing that they enter into paradise. No reckoning, no punishment, no nothing. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he said, these are the people who meaning they do not cauterize themselves. During that time, cauterizing, which they don't necessarily use it today, is if you have a wound, then you would melt some metal and put the heat on it to stop it from bleeding or to stop the disease from spreading. And I'll explain why the Prophet is saying don't do that. It's not that it's haram. He's saying that these people it will enter into paradise because they choose to do without that. <laughs> they don't seek a ruqya. A ruqya is simply to ask someone. You'll find that someone has a, a disease or someone is afflicted with something. And someone just asked me outside that, you know, that they have a child that's afflicted with the evil eye. Can you make ruqya on them? The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يسترقون. They don't ask people to make ruqya because they put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا يكتوون, لا يسترقون, لا يتطيرون. And they do not attribute evil omen to birds or to anything else. In today's time when our children talk about knock on wood, that's attributing evil omen, meaning if we say the same thing at the same time, that's bad luck. Haram in our deen for us to do that. And no matter how much we tell our children to stop doing that, they continue to do it. It's haram. Because we are attributing evil things happening outside of the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no power, no might, no ability to do anything except with the, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No knock knock on wood is going to stop anything from happening. Those are superstitions that we carry with us from jahiliyyah into Islam. Or for those of our children who are watching TikTok and watching Instagram and all of these other non-Muslims with their skewed understanding of spirituality and God and if they even have one to begin with. And our children, Muslims, are taking in this information and corroding their aqidah, corroding their belief about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said these 70,000 people that will enter into Jannah, these are people who don't cauterize, they don't attribute even all evil omen to birds or to anything else. And they don't seek ruqya from other people. Rather, they do the ruqya on, yourself, on themselves. He said, وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And they put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as they're sitting there listening to the Prophet sallallahu saying this, a man by the name of Ukash ibn Mihsan, he stands up and he says, Ya Rasulullah, Udu Allah and Yaj'alim minhum. He said, O Messenger of Allah, make dua to Allah that Allah make me from amongst those 70,000. He said, Enter minhum. You're from amongst them. Just like that. He didn't hesitate. He didn't wait. He didn't think about it. Immediately he was driven by his desire for Jannah. Driven. And he got that spot. Another man jumps up and says, O Messenger of Allah, Udu Allah and Yaj'alim minhum. O oh, Messenger of Allah, make dua to, to Allah to make me from amongst those 70,000. And the Prophet said, Sabaqa ka biha, ukasha. Ukasha beat you to it. It's a competition. Ukasha beat you to it, man. There was only one spot. Why did you wait? What are you waiting for? It's only one spot. And he got it. He didn't hesitate. He heard it. It was like, I want my moment. 
Oh, Messenger of Allah, make dua to Allah that I'm from amongst them. This is competition. And the only reason why Okasha could beat anybody else to that was because of the thinking in his mind. Let me hurry up before somebody else make dua for it. This is a competition. If you think it's not, you are sadly mistaken. Even those of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ who were financially challenged, they appealed to the Prophet ﷺ's inclination towards fairness and justice regarding the disadvantage that they experienced due to their financial situation to somehow level the playing field so that they have a fair chance to compete for higher levels in paradise. Their thought was that they shouldn't be deprived of being in higher places in paradise simply because they're poor. It's not fair. That because you have money and you can give sadaqah and I don't have any money and I can't give sadaqah, you should automatically get a higher place in paradise than me? That's not fair. So some of the fuqara, on the authority of Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala, qala ja'a al-fuqara ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So some of the, the less fortunate companions came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فقالوا, they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, ذهب أهل الدفور من الأموال بالدرجات العلا. They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, the wealthy from amongst your companions have made off with the highest places in paradise. They've made off with the highest places in paradise. When Naim and Muqim and that everlasting bliss that you always keep telling us about. The Prophet said, Okay, for that again, how is this? The Sahaba said, You saluna kamanu salli. They pray like we pray. Well, you sumuna kamanu sumu. And they fast like we fast. وَلَهُمْ فَضْلُ أَمْوَالٍ يُحُجُّونَ بِهَا وَيَعْتَمِرُونَ بِهَا وَيُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِهَا وَيَتَصَدَّقُونَ بِهَا He said, but they have money that we don't have. And so as a result of that, they're able to make hajj with their money. They're able to make umrah with their money. They're able to fight in the cause of Allah with their money. And they're able to give sadaqah with their money. You see, money gives you access. That's what they say in the business world. Money gives you access to sit in big rooms and rub shoulders with so-called important people. In our deen, money gives you access to Jannah. Because look at all of the deeds that they were able to do with their money that the other companions were not able to do. Fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, we're still fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're still fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe not necessarily physically here in America. But we are definitely fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fighting in the cause of God. Anytime we give a person da'wah, call them to Islam, we're fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one less individual that shaitan can use to misguide a whole entire nation. Every time we give da'wah, every time we open up social media and spread the message of Islam, we're fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time we build a masjid, they, they literally knock down every single masjid in Gaza. Every single masjid in Palestine. So every time they knock down a masjid, we should be building another one right here in America. But we sleep. We're not in competition. We don't see this as a competition. Wallah, the wealthy Muslims in the West should say, Wallahi, for every masjid they knock down in Palestine, we're going to build a masjid here. But we don't, we don't think like that. We don't, we don't think like that. That's not where our thinking is, unfortunately. You want to help Palestine? Help Palestine by taking the spirit of the Palestinians and using that for what we can do here in America and in other places. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a front row seat to show you what people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who don't mind risking their lives in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us a front row seat to what that looks like. Because prior to that, we probably would have never seen what that actually looks like. We read it in books, and we can only envision it in our mind, but we have a front row seat today. Masjid is knocked down. They're still praying Salat al Jumu'ah in front of the masjid that's knocked down. La ilaha illallah. Well, we're making excuses here in America. I can't go to Jumu'ah because I got to work. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. How are we going to answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How? How do we answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the excuses that we make to not put forth the effort and the energy that is necessary to build our deen here in a place where we have the permission to do so? 
So the Prophet said, Ala uhadithukum bima in akhaftum adraktum man sabakakum wa lam yudrikum ahadum ba'dakum wa kuntum khayra man antum bayna dhahranihi illa man amila mithrahu. So the Prophet sympathizing with these companions, thinking, how can I level the playing field for them? He said, can I not inform you guys of something? That if you do it, you will surpass the people who came before you, and nobody who comes after you will be equivalent to you except those who do exactly what you do. This is a huge, this is a tall order. That you're about to give us something that if we do it, we will surpass the people who came before us. And even the people that are living in our time now and come after us, they will not even be comparable to us unless they do exactly what we're getting ready to do. Give it to us. What is it? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, listen to what he said. Something that everybody in here can do. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to sabbi'una wa ta'maduna wa ta'miduna wa tukabbiruna khalfa kulli salatin thalathin wa thalathin. The Prophet ﷺ said, say, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, and SubhanAllah 33 times after every salah. How about that? Meaning, you don't need money to give sadaqah. The Prophet ﷺ brought in the scope of sadaqah to accommodate those who don't have the money to give sadaqah so that they can compete, they have a fair chance to compete for Jannah. And another narration where some Sahaba who were financially challenged, they came and they had the same conversation. They said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, bil ujur. Brothers, move up as much as you can, inshallah ta'ala. We'll straighten the ranks out when it's time for salah. But right now, we just want to make sure everyone has a spot on the Musallah, if we can. They came to the Prophet, وسلم, they said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, the wealthy have made off with all the good deeds. The Prophet وسلم, said, Alaysa ka ja'ala Allahu lakum ma tatasaddaqoon nabi. Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you something that you can give sadaqah with? He said, Kullu tasbihatin sadaqah. Every time you say subhanallah is a sadaqah. Don't you know every time you say subhanallah, you get 10 hasanat. And in the month of Ramadan, all of the good deeds are multiplied between 10 to 700 times, depending on your niyyah, depending on your attention, depending on your sincerity, depending on the time in which you say it. Every time you say subhanallah is a sadaqah. Every time you say Allahu Akbar is a sadaqah. Every time you say la ilaha illallah is a sadaqah. Every time you say alhamdulillah is a sadaqah. And enjoying something that is good is a sadaqah. And stopping someone from doing something haram is a sadaqah. Even in the intimacy between a husband and wife, there's a sadaqah. The Sahaba said, are you telling me that when a man goes to his wife, he gets a good deed? The Prophet ﷺ said, don't you see, if he was to go to a woman that was haram for him, he would get sin? Then likewise, you go to a woman that is halal for you, why wouldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for it? It's obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ayah in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِغَافِلًا and your Lord is not heedless as it relates to the good deeds that you do. Allah sees you're trying to be obedient to Him. In a society that is debaucherous as the one that we live in today, sacrilegious as the one that we live in today, to get married and to do things the right way, obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward you. As a matter of fact, we might be from amongst those who, re who get 50 thousand rewards for every good deed that we do as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said excuse me 50 rewards for every good deed that we do as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the Sahaba that there will come people that will come after me they will never meet me they will never have me in their presence and they will live in dark and daunting times and they will have the reward of 50 of you 50 of the Sahaba the Sahaba said on oh, Messenger of Allah you're talking about 50 of them he said no 50 of you they will have the reward of 50 of the Sahaba. That doesn't mean that we're better than the Sahaba because the Sahaba have what's called suhbah. They have companionship. And that is the highest degree of reward that we can have. And we will never have that. So just because you have a greater reward doesn't mean that you're greater or better than the person. But the Prophet ﷺ said they will have 50. The reward of 50 of the Sahaba. 
Right now, we are literally guiding ourselves based upon the statements of scholars and what we have in books. That's it. We don't have the Prophet ﷺ here with us. We don't have him demonstrating our sunnah, uh, demonstrating the sunnah for us. We don't have him making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. We're just trying to do our best. And that within itself is meritorious. But never forget, this is a competition, brothers and sisters. You need to get in the game and understand that this is not a joke. Take your deen serious. Take getting to paradise serious. And there's no greater opportunity to do that than in the month of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you 29, 30 days and said, here, 29, 30 days, show me what you need of. Show me what you can do. And some of us are sleeping half of the day. You're sleeping. While you're sleeping, somebody else is up reading Quran. Somebody is making dhikr. Somebody's giving sadaqah. Somebody's helping somebody with something. Somebody's organizing and arranging and making it life easy for somebody else while you're sleeping. While you're complaining about being hungry. The maidan, maftuh. The playing field is open. Take advantage of the opportunity. Barakallahu li wa lakum fi al-Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum lima fajja'a fihi min al-ayati wa dhikr al-hakim aqulu ma tasma'un astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'il al-mu'minina min kulli dhamb fastaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafur al-rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-lambiyai wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, إِذَا كَانَتْ أَوَّلُ اللَّيْلَةِ مِنْ رَمَضَانِ نَادَ مُنَادٍ يَا بَاغِيَ الْخَيْرِ أَقْبَلْ وَيَا بَاغِيَ الشَّرْحِ أَقْسِرْ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when it is the first night of Ramadan, the first night of Ramadan, which was this past Sunday, that was the first night of Ramadan. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, on the first night of Ramadan, a caller calls out, meaning from amongst the angels that Allah commands to call out, Ya Baghi al Khair Akbar. O you desire of good, O you who are ready to do good, come forward. Because Friday, Sunday night, the first night of Ramadan, there were those of us who were prepared. It's like people at the starting line, waiting for the gun to go off. As soon as the gun goes off, they take off running because it's a competition. It's a race. And so on the first night of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has one of the angels call out and say, Ya baqi al khair akbil. Oh, those of you who intend to do good, who want to do good, come forward. Now is your time. Ya baqi al sharr aqsil. And those of you who want to do evil, go back, go in the back. Go in the back. It's not your time. Your time is after Ramadan is over and you can turn up. Right now, this is not for the people that want to turn up. Right now, this is for the people, not the, the people as the young people say, you want to get lit. Getting lit means there's some fire under you. I don't agree with that particular terminology. I don't want to get lit by nothing. <laughs> nothing. Maybe I'm thinking a little too deeply into it, but the fact of the matter is that our terminology plays a lot on how we see the world. The terminologies we use, it plays a lot on how we view the world. But those of you who are ready to do good, get on the starting line. And those of you who intend on doing evil, then stay in the back. It's not your time. It's not the place of time for you. It's the time for the people who want to do good. So with the month of Ramadan being here, it is an opportunity for those of us who want to compete, for Jannah to compete. It is an opportunity that only comes around once a year, and we never know which year is going to be our last year. So we should perform in Ramadan as if this is going to be our last Ramadan. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, إِذَا أَصْبَحْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَظِرُ الْمَسَاءِ فَإِذَا أَمْسَيْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَظِرْ الصَّبَحِ That if you wake up in the morning, then don't expect to see the night. There's a lot that can happen between the time you wake up in the morning until nighttime. A lot can happen during that time. And there are many people who woke up one morning not knowing that that was going to be their last morning. If you wake up in the morning, don't expect to see the night. And if you wake up at night, or if you reach the night, then don't anticipate to see the morning. And so the same applies with Ramadan. That if you made it to this Ramadan, don't anticipate that you're going to see another Ramadan. Don't expect that you're going to see another Ramadan. 
Make this as if this is your last Ramadan. And so, it's a few examples from the Sahaba so we can visualize very clearly how the Sahaba took competing with one another for Jannah. Abu Bakr anhu, was one of the few of the companions who operated with a level of determination and ambition for Jannah that was unparalleled by anyone during his time or anyone after his time. He was ambitious and he was competitive. And his competitive nature was felt by everyone that he encountered along his journey. Even many of the Sahaba anhu, did not think that they could ever compete with him. And this is because when Abu Bakr saw Jannah as his purpose, he poured all of himself into his purpose. So listen to this narration. Omar anhu, and this is a friendly competition because Abu Bakr and Omar were very close, but they were also in competition with one another. We tend to say, oh, I'm not competing with anybody. That's for dunya. But for the akhirah, for the hereafter, we are all in competition. You might not see it as that, but if the other person sees that he's in competition or she's in competition with you, you already lost. You already lost. Because you don't even see yourself as being a part of the game. You're not even in it. Umar radiallahu he said, مَرَّ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَأَنَا مَعَهُ وَأَبُو بَكَرَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنِ مَسْعُودِ وَهُوَ يَقْرَى الْقُرْحَانِ He said, one day, me, along with the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr were walking, and we passed by Abdullah bin Mas'ud while he was reciting the Qur'an. He was reciting the Qur'an, and we were, just happened to be walking by. He said, فَقَامَ فَتَسَلْمَعَ كِرَاءَتُهُ So when he saw the Prophet وسلم, Abu Bakr and Umar you know, walking by, he began to raise his voice with the recitation. That's the Messenger of Allah وسلم, walking by, I want him to hear me reciting Qur'an. So the Prophet sallallahu walked by ثم مضى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وقال من سره أن يقرأ القرآن كما أنزل فليقرأ من ابن أم عبد The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as he walked by he said to Abu Bakr and Umar whoever wants to recite the Quran like it was revealed from Angel Jibreel to me then let him recite the Quran like ibn Um Abd That was the nickname of Abdullah bin Mas'ud Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, فَأَدْلَجْتُ إِلَىٰ إِبْنِ مَسْعُودِ فَأُبَشِرَهُ بِمَا قَالَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, so I waited until it was night time. That was his first mistake. He said, I waited until it was night. And I crept over to the house of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Because I wanted to tell him what I heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم say about him. I want to give my brother glad, glad tidings. He wasn't hating on him, he wasn't jealous of him, he wasn't envious of him. He heard the Prophet Sallallahu say something good about him, and he wanted to be the first one to convey that information. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, and tudkhil as-surur ala akhik sadaqa. To say something nice to your brother that makes him smile is a sadaqa. To tell your sister your hijab looks nice, sister, or your shoes look nice, sister, that's a sadaqa. She smiles, that's probably the first compliment, the only compliment somebody gave her today. She might have gotten dressed and her own husband didn't even tell her how nice she looked. She comes to the masjid and the sister says, MashaAllah, that hijab is nice. Where'd you get it from? Just made her day. And you're getting a hasanat for it. So I want to go convey this to him. He said, فَلَمَّا سَمِعَ سَوْتِي Abdullah bin Masood, لَمَّا سَمِعَ سَوْتِي قَالَ مَا جَعَ بِكَ هَذِهِ السَّاعَةِ He said, so when Abdullah bin Masood heard me approaching, this is late at night. When Abdullah bin Mas'ud heard me approaching, he said to me, what has brought you out this late at night, Umar? And Umar said, قُلْتُ جِئْتُ لِأُبَشِّرُكَ بِمَا قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, I came to tell you something that the Prophet وسلم, said about you today. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, قَدْ سَبَقَكَ بِهِ Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr beat you to it, man. He, he already told me. He already told me what the Prophet وسلم, said. And Omar, he said, He said, if there was anyone that was going to outdo me, it would have been Abu Bakr because he is the forerunner in doing good. Forerunner in doing good, meaning he is the winner. If I translated, 
In Arabic, literally, it would mean he's the winner. Musabaka, this which is a race. A sabak is the one who won. Sabakun lil khayrat. He is the forerunner in doing good. If there was anybody who was going to beat me to this, it would have been Abu Bakr because he's the forerunner in doing good. He said, Mastabakna khayr qat. He said that I never made a race to go, rush to go, race to go do something good, except that I found that Abu Bakr beat me to it. They were in competition. They were in competition. Even amongst the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I'll end here. Even amongst the women. So we don't think that this is just a man thing. The women took this very serious as well. The Prophet ﷺ on the day of the Eid, he came out to the Musalla and he prayed the Salah. No, no Adhan, no Iqama. This is one of the companions, Jabir ibn Abdullah, narrating to us the day of the Eid. He said, Shahidtu ma'a Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yawm al-Eid. I was with the Prophet ﷺ on the day of the Eid. فَبَدَأَ بِالصَّلَاةِ قَبْلَ الْخُطْبَةِ بِغَيْرِ Adhan وَلَا إِقَامًا So he began with the Khutbah, there was no Adhan, no Iqama. He said, and then after we finished, the Prophet ﷺ walked over to the men and he began to address the men. And Amarahum bi taqwa Allah So he encouraged the men to fear Allah and to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thumma wa'ada al nisa. Then he went over to the women and he began to advise the women. So listen to how this plays out. Thumma ata al nisa. Fa wa'adahunna wa dhakkarahunna. فَقَالَ تَصَدَّقْنَا يَا مَعْشَرَ النِّسَانِ فَإِنَّ أَكْثَرَ كُنَّا حَطَبَ الْجَهَنَّمِ He said, O oh, women, give sadaqah. Fear Allah and give sadaqah. He said, because most of you women are the wood that is used to burn the hellfire. فَقَامَتْ إِمْرَأَةٌ مِنْ وَسَطِ النِّسَانِ سَفْعَاءَ خَدَّيْنِ يعني تغير اللون الخدين. So a woman stood up from the middle of the women, stood up, and her face had, her cheeks had turned color because she was hurt by the Prophet ﷺ's statement. And she stood up and she said, Oh Messenger of Allah, why? Why are women the majority of the people in the hellfire? Why are we the wood that is used to burn the flames in the hellfire? What do we do? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, you're not going to like me for this, but nonetheless, this is the words of your messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Take it as you will. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لِأَنَّ كُنَّا تَكْفِرْنَا الشَّكَاوَى الشَّكْوَى وَتَكْفُرْنَا الْعَشِيرُ لَوْ أَنَّ الرَّجُلْ أَحْسَنَ إِلَى إِحْدَى كُنَّا أَدَّهَرُ ثُمَّ رَأَيْتْ مِنْهُ مَا لَا تُحْسِنَكْ وَمَا لَا يُصُرُّك the Prophet ﷺ said, The reason why that you are the majority of the people of the hellfire, or you are the wood that is used to fuel the hellfire, is because you complain too much. These are the words of the Prophet. I need this in Sahih Bukhari. Not my words. Took fitin al shakawa, that you complain, meaning you're never satisfied. Never satisfied. And I'm saying this to you because if you are someone who does some introspection, you look deeply within yourself, then this is a character flaw, not a fault of your own, but because now you are aware of it, you get to work on it. Nisf al-ilaj, ma'rifat al-sabab, ma'rifat al The half of your cure is recognizing the sickness. Half of your cure is recognizing that you're sick. You keep walking around thinking it's the man's problem, it's society's problem, it's patriarchy, and to the end of it, when do you ever take a look at yourself? He said, you complain too much, and you are dissatisfied with the good that your husband does for you. He said, if a man spent his whole entire life doing nothing but right by you, and you saw one thing that he did that was wrong, you would say, you would dismiss everything by saying, I've never known any good from you. You ain't never did nothing for me. Meaning everything he has ever done since you've been married has been for you. But because he did one thing that you disapprove of, you dismiss everything. And so 
What happened when the Prophet Sallallahu said this? Did the women challenge him and say, oh, this is misogyny. I, this is why I don't agree with the religion. This is why I don't This is why I don't rock with Islam. This is why I'm barely Muslim right now. This is why I don't cover. This is why I don't go to the masjid. This is why I can't take nothing from no man. Sound familiar? Maybe not the women in this room, but definitely the women around the world that's listening. Take issue with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a fact. No, the women, they begin to compete with one another to give sadaqah. Qala, Jabir, he said, as he narrates the hadith, he said, فَجَعَلْنَا يَتَصَدَّقْنَا مِنْ حُلِيِّ إِنَّ يُلْقِينَ فِي ثَوْبِ بِلَاو مِنْ قُرِطَةِ هِنَّ وَقَوَاتِينِ هِنَّ That these women, they now, once the Prophet ﷺ said this, they start taking off their rings, start taking off their necklaces, their toe rings, their anklets. Yes, women wore jewelry during that time. Yes. And they threw it in the thobe of Bilal. Bilal's holding his thobe like this. And they're just throwing their stuff in the thobe of Bilal, giving sadaqah from their gold, from their jewelry. Competing with one another. Because I don't want to be one of the companions of hellfire. And this last one, I have to say this. Please excuse me for going long. Today is the first Jumu'ah for Ramadan, so I, I, I hope that I get a pass for today. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha, she said... This was between the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu And we know that polygyny can be a very competitive space for women who are married, multiple women married to one man. It can be a very competitive space, most of the time for the wrong reasons. Even amongst the Sahabiyat. As during Ramadan, Hafsa came and asked the Prophet Sallallahu to pitch a tent in the masjid for it to calf. The Prophet gave her permission. Aisha saw Hafsa pitching a tent in the masjid for Etikaf. She went and made her a tent. Then this one went and made her a tent. And then Jawadiyah went and got her a tent. When the Prophet ﷺ woke up for Salatul Fajr, he looks in the back, of the back of the masjid. He said, what are all of these tents back here? They was like, those are the tents of your wives. And he realized they in competition with one another. Why are they in competition to perform Etikaf? No. They're in competition because lo. God forbid Hafsa's the only one in the masjid with him. She got full access to him while we got to be at home. So we want to be in the masjid too. They're competing with the Prophet Sallallahu attention. So the Prophet Sallallahu called his wives over and he said to them, Allahu, did you do this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And when he looked at their faces and he realized that they didn't, he said, you know what? I'm not even performing Iqtikaf this year. And he walked out of the masjid. I'm not even performing here to Don't put me in between your ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't put me in between that. This is worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha, she said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Asra'u kunna ilhaqin bi atwadu kunna yadin. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to his wives on one occasion, the one woman from amongst you who will follow me after my death will be the woman from amongst you who has the longest hand. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, or the longest arm. Aisha said, فَكُنَّا يَتَوَلْنَا يَتَطَوَلْنَا أَيَّتَكُنَّا أَيَّتَهُنَّا أَطْوَلُ يَدٍ So Aisha said, so we started comparing our arms to each other, trying to see which one of us had the longest arm. She said, so, كَانَتْ سَوْدَ أَطْوَلُهُنَّ يَدٍ Sauda had the longest arm, as I mentioned last night. Sauda was a very tall woman. And Sauda had the longest arm from amongst us. And she said, Right after the Prophet Sallallahu died, Abu Bakr was the Khalifa for two years, then Umar was the Khalifa. In the 20th year after Hijrah, meaning 19 years after the Prophet Sallallahu death, Zainab bin Tujahsh died. And Aisha, she said, I realized at that point, the Prophet Sallallahu wasn't talking about who had the longest physical arm. He was talking about who gave the most sadaqah. And we learned at that moment that the Prophet ﷺ was correct because Zainab was the first one of us to die and she was the first one to join the Prophet ﷺ after, my, after his death. And we realized that she was the one with the longest arm because out of all of us, she used to give sadaqah from her money. She used to sell, she used to have animals, she used to sell her things, and she used to give her money away sadaqah more than any of the other wives. She was in competition 
They were in competition for the wrong things. She was in competition to get to Jannah. And this also shows the Prophet you know, his revelation that came to him because he wouldn't be able to say that had not Jibreel came to him and gave him that. But Zainab was the first one to die out of the wives of the Prophet and therefore she had the longest arm, meaning she would be with the Prophet because she gave the most sadaqah and dedicated her time and energy. She was given the nickname Um Masakin, the mother of the poor. That's how much sadaqah she used to give. So I leave you with this, brothers and sisters. The month of Ramadan is a month of competition. If you don't think that you are in competition, you have already lost. If you are in competition, then compete for Jannah bi idhnillahi ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us firdaus al-a'la. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-jannah to firdaus al-a'la. Oh Allah, we ask you for the highest place in Jannah. Allahumma inna nas'aluka jannah to firdaus al-a'la. Ya dal jalali wal ikram. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. Allahumma taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiyu al-alim. Wa tuba alina inna ka anta tawab al-rahim. Wa sallillahu ma'ala. على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين وأعطيه الصلاة